They come from the bowels of hell. It's the Dana Gould Hour. Jungle worms and swamp rats run around your feet. I bought a dog that killed the calf that ate the canary. What is true? And once again, welcome back. Today's episode of the Dana Gould Hour is brought to you by my bookie. Not my bookie personally, but the company. Winning season returns at my bookie. What does winning season mean? It means survivor, super contests, and squares. Invest in your intuition. Bet on yourself. Use the promo code DANA and double your first deposit. New players get up to $1,000 in free play. And yes, I do it. I do it with my brother. More on that to come. Howdy! So, the last episode of the show, I spoke to two people, Frank Conniff and Trace Ballou, formerly of Mystery Science Theater 3000, currently of The Mads. Now, Frank and Trace are two people with whom I have so much in common, it is almost like talking to myself. So for this month, I thought I'd talk to somebody with whom you would think, on the surface, I had nothing in common whatsoever. So my guest today, mixed martial arts champion, Josh Barnett. Now, this did not come out of the blue. I met Josh once, socially, Uh, He was uh, an incredibly sharp and uh, fun guy to talk to. There's no reason to think he shouldn't be, but it was still pleasant to find out that he was. And uh, Josh and I zoomed into a talk, and what do you know? We found out that we actually have a ton of stuff in common. So there you go. Scratch the surface with people. You never know. Underneath, we're not all that different. Also, this episode features a book report on the craziest goddamn showbiz memoir you will ever read, Winch, W-I-N-C-H, by Paul Winchell. That's all I'm going to say about it. Just listen and thank me later. Lastly, before we go, let me say a word about our Patreon. We have one. It's simple, and I hope you sign up. Five bucks a month gets you the title Dana Gould Hour, Sky Cadet. And for that, every month you get extra audio interview segments, you get video content. Uh, Pretty soon, coming to our Patreon page is the True Tales from Weirdsville Library, all the middle pieces from all of the episodes indexed for your listening pleasure, and Dana Gould Hour Sky Cadet stickers for your car or lunchbox, or IUD. Just specify, and we'll send you a small one. This is a special show, and we have a weird schedule Not so much anymore. It's getting pretty normal, believe it or not. But our Patreon does reflect that. We don't have graded levels for $73.21. I'm not going to come to the house and shampoo your mom. You're a Sky Cadet. Give me five bucks. You get some stuff and off we go. Go to DanaGould.com for details and DanaGould.com forward slash events for information and ticket sales on all the shows I'm not doing because there's a pandemic. But this show is here. And we are now, and it's all groovy. So let's get on to our filthy business. Dana Gould Hour. Free and worth it. My guest today is the first UFC heavyweight champion that has graced the show. (laughs) <laughs> uh, please welcome uh, former UFC heavyweight champion and uh, MMA champion Josh Barnett. This is the sound of my voice. Now, now, Josh, where where are you coming? Where are you coming to us from today? Uh, generally, the halls of Valhalla, but for now, <laughs> uh, just Certainly some some spot in Hollywood. Uh huh. Some tawdry spot in Hollywood. Yeah. Now, what I found interesting in reading your biography was. It, was short. 
<laughs> the uh, you know, was it the same level as say like reading USA Today or so forth? <laughs> yeah, 12, it was a, twelve year old book. I actually read the the pie chart of the USA Today pie chart biography of your life. But what was interesting to me was I'm the size of your arm, but we started off and started off not dissimilar places and went incredibly divergent paths. I, I always find that uh, fascinating. Um, also, we are both known by the pseudonym, the baby faced assassin. What are the chances? <laughs> And yet there, there is no baby face between us now at any point. I mean, I can cut this beard off, but it isn't going to make anything any more baby-like. No matter how many pacifiers you put in my mouth or how much <laughs> how much uh, Gerber's I've got soaked onto my chin and how many times I shit myself, I'm just not going to be much of a baby anymore. Well, yeah, that's the old story. I slept like a baby, shit in yeah. the bed, woke up crying. <laughs> you grew up in Seattle. Uh, mm -hmm. Washington State, Seattle area? Yeah, in Ballard. I grew up in Ballard, dead in the heart of Seattle. Although, you know, it's funny because I think Ballard uh, was known for much of its lifespan as a separate township within that area. And uh -huh. it really wouldn't surprise me because in Ballard, I literally had a scaled down version of everything you would think of as a community necessity in the modern world. So we had, uh, you know, we had our own we had a paint store, uh, but we also had, uh, uh, there was a paint manufacturing place by Olympic Paints. They were there, or Olympic Stain. We had all of our general sundries and groceries and things, but we had our community places like our bowling alley and, uh, and you know, you've got your general like DFW halls and variants of thereof. But we had uh, tons of, we had a manufacturing area too, because uh, fishing industry was and is still a big part of what is Ballard. It's almost like a little medieval village. Yes. In the middle of Seattle. It's like, it's, it's, well, it's and like since it was, yeah. And since it was started by, like Nor Nor yeah, it was started by yeah. Norwegians. So it is kind of right. like a medieval village. Uh, we had our leap, we have our leap Erickson statue and everything. But, uh, you know, I remember being as a kid, you know, go down to the machine shop, go pick up this engine block that we're getting uh, reboard and, and and decked and whatever. And then and then maybe, OK, something's broke on one of our cars. We go to one of two wrecking yards in downtown Ballard and go pick our parts and and go fix it. So everything was self-contained. We had uh, we had high schools. We, we had one high school. We had a couple middle schools. We had a few grade schools. So everything was really self-contained. And it was interesting that. Uh, as I've gotten older, how literally it was a one-stop shop for the general things that you would need to just get on with getting on. Yeah, like a self-contained uh, self-contained unit. And and you know, in your uh, especially in 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 Seattle, I have a lot of friends from Seattle, and you know, you grow up. It's raining all the time, so you're just you're inside all the time drinking coffee, and you know. The people that I know from Seattle either became musicians or comedians, but it's the same thing. You grow up yeah. frustrated, you grow up indoors, kind of angry, and you have to find an outlet for it. Now, one of the things that I that struck me in in looking at your uh, in looking at your bio is it says had a troubled childhood and often got into fights. <laughs> And I thought, well, I'm half of that. I had a troubled childhood, and I've never been in a fight. <laughs> oh, I mean, that, that, that could just really just add to the troubles to some degree. Yeah. Uh, I you know, I couldn't beat up butter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what about margarine? You think you could at least take margarine? Well, margarine at least sounds feminine. I'd have yeah. a shot. Um, but it, it says that you were put into anger management programs at a young age. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How, did, uh, how does know, that happen? And what uh, is the young age? Uh, let's see. I think I was, let me think, um, 10 years old and 10. You know, yeah. And honestly, um, I, the rain and the gray didn't really get to me that much until I got to be in my twenties. And then some of that was, was, I think exacerbated. And when by, you were in your, you were in your twenties when <laughs> early, no, I'm serious. No, I'm serious. Uh, I'm serious. Early. Early on, uh, yeah, yeah, like two thousand one, two thousand, so around there. Yeah, what I what I was getting was like, you weren't, you missed grunge, like you didn't have that 
That was the identity for angry kids from Oh, Seattle. no, no, I totally had grunge. I mean, the first right. concert I ever but went you, to was... The, uh, the, the, the first blush of it in the early 90s. Oh no no! I, it was all around me. Help my my one of my cousins used to jam with with Kurt Cobain in out in like Montesano or whatever. I mean, so I mean, grunge was all before it hit the national level. Yeah, before right. it hit it the national level. I mean, we had Mother Love Bone and and Soundgarden prior to all this stuff. Blowing. I mean, it was all over the place. I mean, it was just a mm-hmm. part of it. I remember the Gits as a fourteen year old. You know, before Mia right. Zapata died, or I, I believe before she died. But in any case, I mean, it was just that was just a part of the natural sort of scene there. Plus, I had uh, some friends in high school that I actually grew up with through grade school whose brothers were involved in more like we were all into like counterculture kind of weird stuff. And uh, mm-hmm. and I got more of this thrown my direction uh, through this older brother, Eric Hendrickson, who is the oldest, eldest of Sean Hendrickson, who I went to school with. And, uh, okay. I mean, the guy is really pretty, uh, one of the, one of the the key sources for helping guide me into, into, into weirder territory, which I am forever grateful. But, uh, but, but back to the thing about the, the gray and the rain, it really kind of hit me leaving Seattle to go to Abu Dhabi for a, a world grappling championship and being in bright a hundred degree uh, We've all done that, every day. But go yeah. ahead. <laughs> and then coming back and re- leaving, and it had been, I don't remember, like 38 days of straight rain and, and gray. And then coming back and now entering back into that gray, and it had never stopped. Ever since I, even every day I'd been gone, it had still been raining, still been gray. And it just kind of wore on me. But even as I've gotten older, when I go back, the rain of the gray doesn't bug me so much anymore. And I remember what it was like to just go on about your life like normal business. Plus, uh, made for a lot of time indoors, but indoors being cop bookshops, bookstores, uh, museums, uh, places like that. And, and yeah, because well, a lot it of what I do has, It certainly indoors, has that. It fighting certainly and training. has that. Yeah. yeah and, I wanted to, and I wanted to get into how that happened. Is the Cafe Cyclops, was that a part of your childhood up there? No, 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 that one doesn't ring a bell. Um, that might have, that might have, that know, might have uh, phased out before you came of age. Um, I'm 75. <laughs> um, but, oh, you show it well, though. <laughs> but uh, so, what, what is an anger? What is an anger management program for a 10, 11 year old kid? And and what does a 10 or 11 year old kid have to do to get into one? I have an 11 year old, and she uh, basically just does TikTok videos all day, and then occasionally there's sleep and basic hygiene. I mean, I think that would be more anger inducing TikTok, but you know, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, but do, what does one do well, at that age? To get it's into really not anime? that hard. It, it's uh-huh. not that hard. All you have to do is be a young, very energetic uh, kid who was always somebody that, that was more lean towards far more towards being cooperative and, 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 and investigative and, and kind to people, but who had a fuse about this long for being dicked with right. and not realizing that, you know, as a child, you don't have the proper faculties to deal with getting picked on or messed with. And, and you know, some of that can just be because you are different. You know, being bigger makes you stand out in a way. And it, it could be parts of your personality. That, that that is interesting, uh, and that and that is the 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 point that I thought was was very funny. That you're a, you have two brothers, but you're two, right? No, no, no. I have a, a sister who's eight years older than me, and then uh, mm-hmm. that that's it. I mean, I had a I have a brother in law who I've known since I was 18, 17, 16, maybe. Uh, who's do you have half brothers? Uh, it says, it says like in your bio you have ha- It says you had two half brothers. Your Wikipedia. Page no, I don't. F- I don't know what history. any of that's about. Barnett has two. Barnett has two half brothers, Gary Norton and Jackson. What? That's uh, your Wikipedia page. Uh, um. Yeah, that's wonderful. Okay, I have no idea who the hell these people are. Oh, that's Wikipedia for you. Yeah, crowd you shows go. anything, oh, and it will go to shit. <laughs> no, that's interesting. I'm assuming at that age, you know, you're you're a good kid, you're a decent kid, uh, you have a short fuse, 
And you're also big, like you're six three. Yeah, I'm six two, three, but I was always two two fifty five. But I was always right. one of the the tallest kids in my class, you know. Right, so, and uh, even at eleven, at eleven years old, you're. Oh yeah, uh, I was twelve huge. years old, and I was six foot two and two twenty. At twelve years old, yeah. Yeah, I was bigger than men. Yeah. Were you a target? Yeah, well, I was a target. At that age? Uh, well, you know, I was a target for getting messed with, and uh, I would say when I was much younger. It was, I was know, it some suicidal of it, older kids or was it? No, nah, no, nah, it was, I, they didn't really understand what they were doing either. You know, I realized that this is like a, a complete collection of idiots who are completely ignorant to not only their own, their own motivations, their own struggles, their own uh, way of meaning, creating meaning making in the world, because we're all in the same thing. And, you know, these idiots include me too. So uh, we're just dumb kids. And we don't sure. really know Match. how to, how to, yeah, man. And, and you know what, no matter how much you give them uh, in terms of tools or whatever, they're never really going to be, it's just something that's going to come with experience. And so exactly, uh, yeah. uh, I, I think some of it was that uh, what I refer to as a, like a big brother thing, where if you have an older brother or, or, or someone who's like an older brother and you mess with them and they get mad and eventually they chase you after you and you're laughing and giggling and they finally they catch you and beat the hell out of you and you're now you're crying and you're upset, but you'll go back uh, tomorrow and do the same thing. And right. I feel like some of that, I, I, I was a bit of a, a, a proxy for that in some ways, maybe a relationship that way. But also I had to realize that it was my, um, my reacting to what was happening and Simply put, it's just, you know, it's hard to understand for a, a young kid that actually responding to somebody making fun of you or like getting a whole crowd of kids to make fun of you and things like that uh, only encourages them. And so, you know, I don't feel bad about kicking any of their asses because they brought it all on themselves, but it's just dumb kid stuff. But at the time, it really impacted my ability to function in school. and. I kept getting sent to the principal's office to have conversations where I'm going, well, why is it that I am the only person bearing the brunt of, of uh, administrative punishment when I'm not even starting any of this stuff? I'm the target of it. And I mean, it got so bad, I would get isolated in class by the teachers. And so I remember one time a teacher put me off in the corner and then had the whole class write poems about what a bad kid I was. And I'm like, Jesus, what Christ. the fuck? <laughs> yeah. It's like an yeah, episode that's of the called child really abuse. I think nowadays we call that child abuse. Yeah. yeah and clearly yeah, probably you're just so. like, at that point you have the, uh, you know, you have the, uh, you're like a champ with a machine gun. You have the, you have the, the physical capability yeah. to do great damage <laughs> and the emotion, but there just, you don't have the intellectual, the intel, you know, at, at that age, there is no way you could have yeah. the intellectual capacity to ration that. I had five, four older brothers, mm -hmm. still do, got picked on constantly and just learned how to be really funny. That's, that's a, how I got out of it. Well, lacking, it was just a uh, I have no just sense of humor, of the, clearly. <laughs> no, but, 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 but like that was, that was what I, I used the only weapon that I had at my disposal. You know, I was a, I was little, I was a, you know, I was a runty kid anyway. They're all huge. By the time my mother mm -hmm. got me, there was just no more testosterone left to, to add to the mix. Um, uh, so that was that was the wep that was the only wep that was the only uh, uh arrow in my quiver that was the, <laughs> in my it's a good one that too. was the only weapon in my arsenal uh you just used what you used what was closest in, in your case it was your physicality it was it and well yeah so I, I mean there's some of that I, totally, uh, um, I think I that understand. i'm just naturally born uh to be a physical like i i on i truly believe that that, that just being in in combat and things like that just they come and it always has come exceedingly easy for me like i i never yeah. had a problem with with the with states of violence and such like that it just it just never it, it it's a weird thing to say and i understand that it's hard i'm, for I'm just to, like that only not at all to relate to that <laughs> that's that well that is the i wanted to get to that but when you it must be really interesting the first time you get really, and I guess this happened to you as a kid, when you get really hit, 
and you think, oh, that's it? Oh, okay. Now I can hit. <laughs> you know, because the, the whole, as somebody with older brothers can tell you, you know, the, the fear of getting hit stops once you've been hit and you realize, oh, is that it? Oh, okay. All right. Well, it definitely makes that. a difference. I mean, you realize uh, how much more you can handle than you ever thought. But uh, I think some of it really stemmed from it was uh, I took things to heart way too easily. So getting picked on and things like that, it just, it, I, I let it get into my, my deeper uh, part of being. And right. so that's well, you, why you take, I would respond. You take it very personally, yeah. yeah. But also, uh, I mean, there were times like I had, I, I mean, I, you never, these things just would happen without any real rhyme or reason, but you know, something to get started. And then I'd have like eight or so kids like encircling me running around. So I can't get to them potentially, you know, making right. fun of me and I'm, you know, pissing me off and seeing, seeing me respond. And then at one point, like one kid come up, kick me in the ass and try and take off. And I'd catch him every time and beat yeah. the holy hell out of them. And then I'd get in trouble for it. And so it right. was just a yeah. really, no, I get that. It was dumb. And we had that, we had that kid in our neighborhood. We had Rusty Putnam was the Josh Barnett of our neighborhood. <laughs> it was just like, yeah, it was just the, he was like, it was like, <laughs> you're like the villagers messing with the giant. You know, a little like, bit like, let's that, go yeah. annoy the giant. He can't kill all of us. <laughs> no, but he'll kill the slowest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, don't don't trip or don't don't have a chocolate or a belly too full of chocolate. You can't run. You know what I mean? Yeah, you better run. Yeah, you better you better learn how to run. And so, it, it, but then at a at a pretty early age, you got into uh, you got into a coach took you aside and and got uh, you into wrestling. Not until um, high school, really. And so I had a really, you know, it got to such a problem uh, that I, so I was in a, a special or an advanced kids program early on that I tested into simply because. The kids that I was in kindergarten with weren't there for the first day of first grade. And I'm going, well, what the hell's going on? What I don't I don't recognize any of this. I don't know any of these people. Like none of this makes any sense to me. And I see them in the hallway and I go, why, why aren't why are we not in the same class? And they go, Oh, well, I did this thing and I tested them. So I'm in this other program called Horizon. I'm all, well, I want to do that. So I go to my mom and I just said, Hey, I want to be with my friends. Go take me to this test thing. And so I went and she, she takes me and I, I go down there, I do my tests and then they come, I guess they all, according to mom, they come back and they're like, oh, actually he's in, he, he placed up in this other program that's, that's higher yet, but it only is available in one school that you would have to bus to every day or you'd have to drive him to. And so she's like, well, I don't want to do that. And my whole thing was, I didn't give a shit about any of that. I just wanted to be with the kids that I knew. Yeah. So like, you just want to be with thing. your social group. Yeah. That's, that's, that uh, I, I had no idea. And before we leave childhood, did you ever, like all of these kids that gave you a hard time when you're 10, 11, mm -hmm. these teachers that didn't misunderstand you, did you ever encounter them in your adult life? And did you, and because uh, certainly I've had my versions, my versions of that. Mm -hmm. And then you go off and you become a success and you, and you re-encounter them. Uh, you know what? I made a point to let the teachers that I've had in my life that I felt were really key in, in helping me as a student and were always the ones to actually sit down and, and try to, to, to really lend an ear and understand. I made it a point to always go back whenever possible and, and tell them that I appreciated them and to, to give you know, things of positivity and to tell them that, you know, you did a, you did a good job and you should be happy with, uh, with what you were able to do for me. And so, uh, you know, trying to, to do things more bent on increasing the, the positive elements out there and, right. and supporting that than, than really ever being like, Hey, remember this guy you used to fuck with? Uh, now the closest to that I would say would be, uh, being somewhere going back to Ballard and having someone from high school go, Oh yeah. Hey, do you know so-and-so like, well, no. Well, he says you guys are buddies. You used to hang out all the time. Like, I don't fucking <laughs> yeah. know that guy. No, I don't know that guy. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, yeah. When you do go back, uh, you, you don't enjoy it. Like what the, like the ha ha look at me now. Uh, it, it's, you don't enjoy it. And if you do enjoy it, you have some more therapy to do. <laughs> <laughs> I can't recall exactly much of what it was really in, in a whole lot of detail, but I know that it was just, it was trash. It was just like, 
hey, suppress everything about yourself, you know, completely right. compartmentalize and and bring yourself down to a lower state of energy and just, you know, you know, just be a, a, a fragment, uh, some sort of shell version of a, of a real human being. And so, yeah, just let everybody treat you like shit and it'll all work out. It's like, no, it won't. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it certainly didn't. Who was Jim Harrison? Jim Harrison was the person I would say was my first real coach as far as uh, being being t- in in regards to being a fighter. He ran a dojo. Yes, Is that correct? yes, Sakura Warrior Arts in Missoula, and he did just pass away this year. Uh, but oh, Sakura funny. Warrior Arts is still there. Um, the and uh, I always intended to fight in the UFC or anything of that nature, if possible. And so I was still continuing that journey as well as everything else that I was trying to sort through in my own development. And uh, he was just another one of those people in my life that is uh, really a key towards my development as a man and as a human being. And he was a great father figure to me. He, he really showed me what being tough was. I mean, the guy... And, and how to how to earn people's respect by your actions and, and not just by words. How do you mean by showed you what being tough really was? From the physical to the mental to to all elements. You know, it's like the idea of strength or toughness in it is not one dimensional. You know, it takes a lot to be strong. You know, one of the strongest things a person can do is to say, I don't know. And sit back and be the person that that listens and and takes takes a, the, a lower position, especially if they're used to being the one uh, dictating or being in the the let's say the higher higher position from from their status. Like uh, that's that's why the president we have now is so great is his humility. <laughs> well, he definitely uh, doesn't really have a whole lot of humility. <laughs> that's for sure. He is a an a one bullshitter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I believe malignant narcissist sociopath apply. Um, but no, that is interesting because I do know like one thing, like from what I know about if you go to study Kung Fu as opposed to karate or Jodo, or the Kung Fu specifically, from what I understand, which is next to nothing, uh, it's it's much more of a spiritual mm-hmm. pursuit and a mental and a, ment- a mental discipline and a spiritual pursuit. Would you say that's would you say that's correct? No, I would say that Kung Fu, as m- most people uh, would imagine it here in the West, is just a giant grift of teaching you to try and basically really? uh, uh, in, fan, fan, put, put your fantasies about being Bruce Lee or something like that into practice, all hidden behind the, the rubric of, oh, we can't actually tr- we can't actually train for real because, oh, I might kill you because my secrets are too <laughs> deadly. And, no. right. uh, but for the most part, Kung Fu is just a, a way to to make you believe that you're not going to get your ass kicked while someone's beating the crap out of you. (laughs) Really? Yeah. It's, I mean, spar and fight, but that's really rare. Um, Most Uh of Kung Fu and there's a lot of karate out there too. It's the same thing. It's just all Orientalism and, and fancy, you know, theoretical, whatever put together by a bunch of guys who've never been in a real fight. Right. Right. And Which you, is judo? Ju, 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 yeah, well, I mean, Sakura, that, and, but you studied you studied what Sakura Warrior Arts? Is that what you said it was? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and that is a karate school and judo school. But the thing is, Jim Harrison's the one of the was the first U.S. light heavyweight kickboxing champion. He used to do karate way back in the '60s, where they would they would hit for real. Uh, the guy uh-huh. competed in judo. He also was a special. He's like some sort of a special unit guy that used to work in East St. Louis and had been shot and stabbed and, you know, I mean, dealt with. <laughs> uh, he's been in real fights and real incursions and fights. You could call him a fight. I mean, it's a com- combat of sorts where his yeah, life was it's on just the line. Try, it's more trying not to die than, than an actual fight. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like uh, summoning the willpower after somebody put a bullet hole into your chest and being able to get your ankle gun to take this guy out before he finishes wow. the job. Wow. So so to that end, as somebody who is a martial arts expert, have you ever watched specifically a Roger Moore 
James Bond movie and saw Roger Moore mm-hmm. in a fight and thought, this is fake. <laughs> I just don't believe that. I, Roger I think if Moore I watched one today, beat up anybody. <laughs> I just Sean Connery. I can believe I, it is Craig, a bit hard to believe. imagine Roger Moore. I just don't see him. Be, I can see him picking out flatware. Like, like, like I would want Roger Moore with me if I needed to buy a piece of art. Uh, I don't see him. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh dear. I just don't buy Roger Moore. Kicking yeah. anyway. And there was always, he's always going to the dojo where yeah. he, he learns as much as everyone there, but they've been there for 10 years and he does it in a week. <laughs> it's always been yeah. Hard. Roger Moore is the kind of guy that tells you the difference between uh, Rococo and neoclassicism. He's the exactly. guy that, uh, uh, yeah. Would you, you like know, he, uh, he tells you the difference in the gradings of silver. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, he complains about his martini. That, that's Roger Moore. Exactly. But uh, I, I did really love all the, I got into James Bond with Roger Moore, James Bond. And yeah, the that first age, one was yeah, uh, that generation. Let Die. Right. Yeah. The, but the I still prefer Sean walk-up. Connery, James Bond. Yeah, that's the real one. The best, Live and Let Die is, if only for <laughs> tiptoeing across crocodiles, is a great movie. <laughs> oh, it was great. Well, and Yafet Koto. Oh, he's so good. And he gets yeah. shot with a bullet that blows him up with a with a bunch of gases. And then yeah. there's that weird henchman of his with that with the steel uh, hand. Yes, the guy with the steel this, hook. Uh, well, here's the crazy thing. Yeah, laugh. Koto, yeah, yeah, Fat Koto. I believe I could be wrong. Correct me. One of the tropes of James Bond villains is that they all have a physical deformity. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess Goldfinger didn't have one either, but Doctor No's hands were fucked up. Uh, it's and it's always well, what about uh, Scaramanca or whatever? I don't think he had a physical deformity. He had two he nipples, he had three nipples. That's how you that's how you could identify him. He had <laughs> he had a superfluous nipple. That's uh, okay. Well, that'd make uh, you want to kill people, that's for sure. Yeah, exactly. Or, or just, Over- just, just, just remind me to buy overstimulated, <laughs> but but yeah, yeah, Fat Koto was one of the first ones who was just like, No, I'm just gonna, uh, I'm just myself, I'm just yeah. myself. But they, yeah, it was one of the things Ian Fleming always threw in, or they, or he had a henchman with it, some kind of physical deformity. Um, God, that's yeah, because in, in, uh, in, if you remember, in the Spy Who Loved Me, which is mm-hmm. basically a remake of You Only Live Twice, the guy in the Spy Who Loved Me was obsessed mm-hmm. with the ocean, and he had webbed fingers. That was they, <laughs> gave, they gave him a little, yeah, they gave him a little. Weird. Oh God, I got but so much to what, revisit. Yeah, but every kid, yeah, like every boy I know grows up watching like James Bond movies and, and fantasizing. And and I would think to be a martial mixed martial artist would take so much fun out of enjoying those movies. Ah, uh, you know, like, I can't uh, watch maybe... a comedy special without taking taking it apart, like looking at the math of the writing of the the algorithms of somebody's joke writing ability. And so it's and so and by by twenty minutes into it, I I can. As I hear the joke, I know what's going to, you know, I yeah. can see where they're going with it. I would say it's a... Uh, it can you really still disengage con- and enjoy it? It's really contextual. So if someone's trying to pass something off to me and and get me to believe it, depending on how reality-based they want it to be. So if I'm watching Roger Moore, James Bond, I, I walk right in thinking <laughs> it's, it's all at least Moonraker or below in terms of level of realism. <laughs> And so uh, there's no uh, below Moonraker. <laughs> I'm I'm fine. I'm good to go. Uh-huh. <laughs> but uh, um, if if you say you bring me James Bond with uh, uh, the the most recent ones, uh, who is Daniel that? Craig? Uh, Daniel Craig. Daniel Craig. Now, if you yeah. give me a Daniel Craig James Bond, you're putting me. You're asking me for a different suspension of disbelief. Right. So if you then give me a bunch of BS on screen with that. I'm just going to, I'm going to check out. Uh, It'll it'll be too much for me. I will say he bumped into me at a party once and it was like getting hit by a car. He does look (laughs) like he's built up that older type of uh, actor. Uh, I I I mean, he's a rock. He's a, he's a, he's, he's, he's not that tall. He's only a little bit taller than I am. I'm five, eight. Um, I don't think he's six feet tall, Mm -hmm. Um, but he's solid. Uh, you know, I think it's I think that's important when you want to embody something, especially he's had a lot of roles where it isn't necessarily even about being James Bond. But 
he plays roles of, of, of men that are out adventuring and action and, and yeah. being put in places He's where they, they need a body that can actor. facilitate. He's yeah. a very physical actor. And uh, it, it reminds me of a lot of the old actors that I like so much, like uh, Lee Marvin and Charles Bronson right. and Sterling you know, Hayden. Just, yeah, just super yeah, tough these guys. That look like, guys. Yeah, well, there's a famous, you might, you might know the story. Um, there's an actress, Lana Turner, at her height in the, in the 50s, dated Johnny Stompanato. Johnny Stompanato was a gangster and a thug. He was one of Mickey Cohen's enforcers. Mickey mm. Cohen ru- ran the West Coast. And Johnny Stomp, as was his nickname, was one of his enforcers. He dated Lana Turner, who was a big movie star and often kicked the shit out of Lana Turner. Actor in the movie, pre-fame, a Scottish uh, former truck driver named Sean Connery. <laughs> and Johnny Stompanato goes down to the set of Lana Turner's movies to threaten every male actor on the movie not to fuck with Lana Turner. And famously, like, would, you know, open up his coat and put his arms on his chest so you could see he was packing a gun. Mm-hmm. And, and Connery had a bit part in the movie. It, wasn't, it was not a big part. But famously, Johnny tried to threaten Sean Connery. Sean Connery told him to fuck off. Johnny went to threaten him with his gun. Sean took the gun from him, threw it, beat the shit out of him. (laughs) Two or three years later, Johnny was murdered by Lana Turner's daughter. Oh. uh, You know, came in on him beating her mom up for the last time and stabbed him to death. Good. And that's the story of Johnny Stump. You deserve a treat from a Tasty Freeze Big Tea. Have a Big Tea burger and fries with a milkshake. We have 51 givers. Take a bucket of chicken to the movie with you. And don't forget our delicious Tasty Freeze desserts. Tasty Freeze Big Tea, 423 Western Avenue. They're true tales from Weirdsville. Tales from Weirdsville. Well, we've all heard this story before. A young man with a troubled youth from the wrong side of the tracks grows up to become an MMA champion. But what about the story of the young man from the wrong side of the tracks with a troubled youth who grows up to become a ventriloquist? You heard me. Sit back, get comfortable, and prepare to hear the story of Winch, Paul Winchell. Now, you may not know who Paul Winchell is, but you've heard his voice throughout your childhood. Oh, uh, glad to meet you. Name's Tigger. T-I-double-G-R. That's spells Tigger. The wonderful thing about Tiggers is Tigger the wonderful thing. The tops are made out of rubber. The bottoms are made out of spring. But before he was Tigger... Along with his dummies, Jerry Mahoney and Knucklehead Smith, Paul Winchell was one of the most popular ventriloquists in America in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. With a popular kid show in the 50s, The Paul Winchell and Jerry Mahoney Show. The Paul Winchell, Jerry Mahoney Show. Featuring Knucklehead Smith. Here they are now, Paul Winchell and... He was also one of the early proponents of bodybuilding. He was an inventor, holding a patent on one of the first artificial hearts. He came up with the idea of the disposable razor about 10 years too early, and there is so, so, so much more to talk about with Paul Winchell. But by far, the most interesting aspect of Paul Winchell's story is his self-published memoir, Winch, in which he goes into great detail about being, well, I guess the medical term would be crazy as a shithouse rat. The fact that this is no ordinary showbiz memoir becomes obvious around page three, 
when a 12-year-old Paul learns that the reason he seems so uncoordinated is because of a bout with polio that left one leg about an inch and a half shorter than the other, to which his loving mother Clara responds, You're a lame piece of shit. Paul's father was horrified and responded, Our boy has polio. To which Clara replied, You're a lame piece of shit, and you trip over your own feet. I can tell you that because I'm your mother. Poor Clara. She didn't have it easy, and now it was Paul's turn. And her husband's turn. And her daughter's turn. And her daughter's... It was anyone's turn who crossed paths with her. What Clara is reported to have done to young Paul in the book would today be described as child abuse. Most of the interesting physical corrections Clara employed were apparently passed down to her from her mother, of course, Grandma Frida. Frida had been a midwife back in the small town in Austria from which she came. She also performed unsavory deeds for the local big shots when they required her, quote, services, end quote. When a civic leader discovered that his lover was with child, Frida eliminated the problem, tossing the dead fetus over the cemetery wall on her way home. Thanks, Paul. That was colorful. The Winchells lived on Coney Island in the 1930s when Paul was a little boy, and on one trip to the boardwalk, he discovered that Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy, who were popular on radio at the time, was really just Edgar Bergen and a chunk of wood. The fact that a ventriloquist had a highly successful radio show was another matter for another time. Winchell, by now is about 12, 13, purchased How to Be a Ventriloquist by Edgar Bergen and began to teach himself how to throw his voice. He practiced all day, every day. Not only did his perseverance pay off in terms of skill, he was a great ventriloquist, by the way, but he could throw his voice so successfully, he one day convinced his mother that someone was trapped in the closet in his bedroom. His reward for such a funny prank was to get whipped with an actual whip that his mother kept in her apron. On the upside, concentrating on his diction helped him overcome a debilitating stutter that he suffered from as a child, so he could say things like, please don't whip me. The America's Got Talent of its day was Major Bo's original amateur hour. Paul Winchell entered and won and was invited to join the show's tour. Now, one of the guys he toured with was a singer who did well on the show a year or two earlier named Frank Sinatra. Paul dropped out of high school to join, but this was the Depression, and not only was money money, but it got him away from his mother, or so he thought. He quit the tour in Denver and landed in Hollywood, living in a rooming house and working around town, until one night at a nightclub, his mother stood up in the audience and started heckling him. She had not come out to California to take him home. She came out to stay. If this was Jaws, his mother would have shown up frequently with three yellow barrels floating above her. The memoir proceeds with a lot of show business boilerplate about what it was like to tour opening for big bands in the 40s. Paul gets signed to William Morris, etc., etc., etc. So I'm skimming now. Basically, Clara moves to L.A. to be with Winchell, so he moves back to New York. But something funny happens along the way. And danged if chapter four of the book doesn't end with the promise of riches to come. And I quote, I limped into New York with a raging case of gonorrhea. End quote. I'm listening. Now, this was back before penicillin, so when you had gonorrhea, you had gonorrhea. Paul was nursed through his ordeal by the cashier at the theater he was working at. Eventually, this woman named Dottie moved in with him, and after several months, she confessed that she loved him. Yep. She confessed her love to the gonorrhea-ridden ventriloquist she was living with but not sleeping with. Okie doke! According to the book, the conversation went like this. You know, Paul, we've been living together for more than a year now, and I think we might just as well get married. I know, Dottie, but I've warned you. I'm not even sure I know what love is. How is that possible, Paul? I guess you'd have to ask my mother. If that's the problem, I don't think I want to meet her. Well, how are you going to avoid it if we get married? Are you proposing? Da 
body for the win. Or was it? Paul gets cured of the clap. He and Dottie tie the knot. Paul's mother comes out to visit, and it's a catastrophe, of course. Eventually, after only a few days, a deeply traumatized Dottie drives Clara to the train station to make sure that she gets on the train and leaves for California. If only that she will know, with her own eyes, that she is really gone. Oh, by the way, by this time, Paul is 18 and Dottie is 19. Well, Paul and Dottie stay in New York, they have a couple kids, and Paul's career takes off with a primetime television show in New York, this is around 1953, called The Paul Winchell Jerry Mahoney Show. Jerry Mahoney, obviously, being Paul's ventriloquist dummy. Paul started tinkering with being an inventor, and he pitched disposable razors. The problem is this was still the early 50s, and it was too close to the Depression for anyone to be in the habit of throwing away something that still technically worked. And it would take another 20, 25 years before Gillette finally scored with the idea. But all was not right at home. Dottie and Paul were never in love, and Paul, to be honest, was quite open about that fact. He wasn't even sure he was capable of the emotion, as he had never experienced it in childhood. And talking about his daughter Stephanie, Paul writes, What did I contribute to hearth and home? Mostly material things, I'm sorry to say. Stephanie had everything a kid could ask for. Horseback lessons, art classes, swimming pool, a giant trampoline in the yard, ice skating lessons, tennis lessons, dogs, parakeets, a nanny. You name it, she had it. Love, I gave the best I could. But how can you give what you never learned at home? Well, you can, Paul. You gotta try. It's your kid. Man up. Paul's mother, Clara, finally passes away, as one does, and that's when Winch really gets into overdrive. Things get hopping right away. He gets news that his mother only has a few days to live and heads out to L.A. from New York. On his way to the airport, there's a plane crash. Winchell writes, On the way, the cab had to make several detours because the wreckage of the aircraft was strewn over a five-block radius. The remains of passengers and crew were scattered amongst the rubble. It was a horrible sight. But all I could think of was that my poor mother was dying. His poor mother that he hated, by the way. But something in her death changed something in Paul about his perception of his mother. His description of her last moments is pure poetry. My mother's breathing became labored. It was like a cat trying to vomit, but much worse. But that is true. The minute she dies, he completely elevates her into a saint. And it takes her three times to fully die. Jason Voorhees was easier to kill than Paul Winchell's mother. But when she's gone, she's Saint Clara, and Paul starts torturing himself for being a shitty son. Clara's grip on her son Paul from beyond the grave is almost instantaneous. She appears in the sky outside the airplane window on the flight back to New York. One night, she appears at the foot of his bed claiming, Good news, Paul. I have ascended. I am the wind and the stars. I am the maker of worlds. Okie doke. Anyway, Winchell's ventriloquism career continues to ascend. One thing I didn't know was... Remember all those dirty limericks that made Andrew Dice Clay famous in the early 90s? Well, Paul Winchell was having his dummy Jerry Mahoney do them in the 1950s. Why don't you tell us a nursery rhyme, Jerry? Jack and Jill went up the hill. Each had a buck and a quarter. Jill came down with two and a half. Who said they went up for water? Now, Jerry, don't say a dirty limerick to these nice people. How about this one? There was an old lady that lived in a shoe. She had so many children, she didn't know what to do. There was another old lady that lived in a shoe. She didn't have any children. She knew what to do. Oh, Jerry. But slowly, the ghost of Winchell's mother began to worm its way into Winchell's life, disturbing his sleep and haunting his waking hours. He heard her voice when the wind whispered through the trees, when it rained, when there was thunder or lightning, it was Clara. Never satisfied, always berating. It destroyed his sanity and sent him finally to therapy. 
Now, it took one or two runs at the mountain to attack Paul Winchell's psychosis, and eventually, the doctor hit on a plan. Since Paul was a ventriloquist, he should make a ventriloquist dummy of his dead mother so he could experience controlling her and not vice versa. Sounds like a terrible idea, doesn't it? Well, it gets worse. Acquiring the parts for this grim task was an exercise in the bazaar. I had a dentist make a full set of dentures from photographs. Then I bought a wig of human hair that matched hers and got a pair of chimpanzee eyes at a taxidermist. That's why we all know that old radio commercial from the 1950s. When you're building a ventriloquist dummy of your dead mother to perform a psychological exorcism on and hopefully get a good night's rest, only the finest taxidermy chimpanzee eyes will do. Hansons! Hey, guess who walked in on Paul having a screaming argument with a ventriloquist dummy of his dead mom with false teeth and taxidermy chimpanzee eyes? That's right, his wife Dottie. After the divorce, Winchell developed an artificial heart, entered med school, and became a certified hypnotist. And then he met Rosetta, who auditioned for a part on his children's show and who swept Paul off his feet into a hypersexual love affair that was only marred by the fact that Paul was unstable and she was married with kids. And that she might just be the only woman on earth more emotionally sadistic than Clara. But you go with what you know, and they were soon living together. Now again, this is all from Paul Winchell's point of view, and who knows what she was like in reality. He doesn't sound like a dream to live with either, to put it mildly. When Paul died, he was estranged from all of his children, but they don't come up again in the book, so maybe it's not that important. Anyway... Rosetta grows angry at Paul because he won't let her sleep around. So Rosetta begins dressing up like a dominatrix, whipping Paul in the face and chest, and insisting he call her Clara instead of Rosetta. Along the way, she says one of those things that you never want to hear from your romantic partner. I'm your therapist now. <laughs> okay. So Winchell cracks and, fearing for his own life at his own hand, has himself committed to a hideous state mental hospital where he is strapped to a table for 24 hours, unsupervised, just so he knows what will happen if he misbehaves. According to the climax of Winch, Paul utilized his old childhood prank, using his voice-throwing ability to convince a guard that someone was locked in a linen closet, and escaping to what is now Hollywood Forever Cemetery, where, clad in a hospital Johnny, Winchell, in a delirium, confronts a tribunal of Egyptian gods and his dead mother's ghost at her grave. He is put on trial for being a terrible son to his mother. He writes, and I quote, I looked up and saw a jackal-headed being I recognized as Anubis. There was fire, there was screaming, Amidst the fury of flames and the cacophony of screaming souls, the wind, now unrestrained in its force, violently hissed through the pit. Suddenly a voice boomed out through the chaos of pain, a voice which had bled into every fiber of my miserable life, my mother's voice, pronouncing in its intractable edict, Paul, thou shalt write my book. Oh yeah, that's the thing the ghost wants. She's dictating a book to Paul that he should write. He goes on to write, Sentinels loosed their lions, which raced across the bridges in the lake and headed straight towards me. This is true. Hollywood Forever Cemetery does have bridges and a lake. Suddenly a thick fog formed over the water. In the far distance, I could see a tiny rowboat heading in my direction. I peered into the mist, trying to discern who the figure was. Was it his children coming to save him? Winch! It called from a distance. Oh my God, I recognize that voice anywhere, no matter how faint. It was Jerry Mahoney, Paul's ventriloquist dummy. Jerry, go away, I yelled. Look, Winch, look. He was closer now, and I could make out details as he bent over and blew on the water. Waves became agitated. He tried it again, blowing harder, his breath creating the seed of a gale, which assumed a life of its own. As I watched, it became even fiercer, turning into a tsunami that drenched the tribunal. Clara and the Egyptian gods, Thoth, 
It's probably Toth, by the way. It's T-H-O-T-H, and I don't know how to pronounce it. And Isis as well. How'd you do that? I called out to Jerry. Really? You care at this point? Anyway, then I heard another familiar voice faintly in the distance, far over on the other side of the lake, in a second rowboat. It was Knucklehead Smith, his other ventriloquist dummy. Myth the Winkle! Myth the Winkle! Now let's remember, he's having a psychic break at his mother's grave at night in the Hollywood Forever Cemetery. This is all going on in his head. We have no idea what it really looked like. But at one point, he finally does what Knucklehead Smith tells him to do. He says the password, which is the password from his kid show. He writes, The password was one we used in our opening song on Winchell Mahoney time. Skada wada doo doo. I began to mutter it under my breath. Skada wada doo doo. Skada wada doo doo. Skada wada doo doo. Anyway, somehow, the ventriloquist dummy visions save him from his mother and the cast of The Mummy. And the following morning, finds Paul Winchell back in the mental hospital, still in a Johnny, and he tells the story to his therapist, and the therapist says, Wow! He was cured, just like that. And then, according to the book, the phone rang in the doctor's office at the mental institution. And it was Sebastian Cabot, the narrator from the Winnie the Pooh cartoons, calling to offer him the role of Tigger, in the new cartoon, Winnie the Pooh. I'm not kidding. Now, in the same way that a seed of grass will sprout out through the concrete of a sidewalk, sports season is slowly returning to our version of reality, and that means that winning season returns at my bookie. Winning season means doubling your first deposit. Winning season means Survivor, Super Contests, Squares. Now, I did not know about my bookie. Uh, my brother turned me onto it. We were on the phone talking about uh, the Michael Jordan documentary. He was watching a game. He was going to place his bet. I didn't know what he was talking about. I went to the website. He walked me through using it. It's incredibly simple. And uh, now this is the this is the thing we do. We, uh, we bet against... Well, we don't bet against each other all the times, but we... Uh, we watch games and we bet on them. It's super, super fun. Um, and that is why my bookie is always the right play. You bet, you win, and they pay. At my bookie, winning season means hitting all of your parlays with your feet up. You can kick back and watch your team play and hopefully win. NFL season's on its way back. Why not take this opportunity to bet on yourself? Invest in your own intuition and use the promo code DANA and double your first deposit. New players get up to $1,000 in free play, designed to add more excitement to the sports you love and the games you bet. From live betting to championship futures, every play you want to make is waiting at my bookie. It's simple. Make your picks, win big, collect your cash. Use the promo code DANA, D-A-N-A, and double your first deposit. Your winning season begins today at my bookie. That's M Y. B-O-O-K-I-E dot com on your computer. I do it. Settle back now, content, comfortable, well-fed, and ready for some fine entertainment. Is everybody happy? Then let's go. It's showtime. Good. And that's the story of Johnny Stomp. But it's also, it's a good story for Sean Connery, too. It is. It is a good story for Sean Connery. And, uh, you know, there's a there's a certain... They don't have those actors anymore. You know, I'm sure, you, I would like to think that some of it is uh, someone showing up to to throw their weight around in a place where there's where it's completely unnecessary. But also... A hundred percent. Someone who, who's, who's doing it to be a dick to his woman. Right. You know, yeah. I have plenty of stories of my fighter friends coming across uh, engagements outside of bars and stuff like that. Someone being a jerk to a girl or whatever. And then just being like, all right, hey, what do you want to do about this? And the guy's like, you better mind your manners. I'll kick your and just crushing them. 
and just letting them, yeah. you know, leaving them on the streets. Like, well, I shouldn't have been messing with that woman. That is a fantasy that every guy has to be able to just shut down an asshole, but not every guy has the ability to. Well, yeah, 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 true. Well, you, you could confuse <laughs> them or, uh, you know, I mean, that could work or like, like a, buy them a, a, a street dog that has been spoiled. <laughs> so well, this is a story. Th this is a story that I've that has been told on this podcast. I have a very good friend, um, a, a, a really wonderful human being named Kevin Fitzgerald. Kevin uh, is now it lives in Denver, Colorado, and he's a veterinarian. He actually had a show on Animal Planet called Emergency Room Vets. And Kevin is a giant Irish guy, and his brother is another giant Irish guy. And in the uh, 1970s, he and his brother were security for the Rolling Stones. Mm -hmm. And they toured with the Rolling Stones from 69 to 83. And he said they didn't have the authority. They weren't cops. They didn't have any official. They couldn't eject people from the building. They were uh, just to keep people off the stage away from the Rolling Stones. But he would say one of the tricks they would do is if somebody was out of line, what they would do is to engage them, they'd ask them, they'd approach them and ask them, First, they'd re reason with them, like, look, you might be able to take me, but you can't take all six of us. Then you're going to get you're going to go home. Gonna, as Kevin said, you're going to have breakfast on the county. You don't want to do that. But if they were drunk or they, uh, he goes, we'd ask them a nonsense question. <clears throat> I'd ask them, where'd you park? And that which is not a question they're expecting. Mm -hmm. And as the cow, what? Huh? They he would they had a leather saps and they just bop them behind the ear <laughs> and they'd go down and usually get sick because you have vertigo. Mm -hmm. And then they would just tell the cops he's drunk, get him out of here. And they just, that's how they, that's how they get them. That's how they get him out of the concert. Smart. You know, a much, yeah, much just of like these throw sort them of off of the are... weird question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, much of these things are, uh, are more than just, uh, outright physical. Uh, and I've trained bouncers and doormen and stuff like that before. And, and a lot of it is, is really all the, the dialogue ahead of time, which is usually the most useful thing to, to shut down, um, any sort of, uh, physical conflict. How so? Like if, you know, you get a drunk guy up there, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. It's just yeah. like, that's, you know, the, like the big belligerent drunk. Yeah. Well, and, you know, the, the, and their first physical move is going to be just to charge you. Yes. But before that ever happens. They're even even in their drunken state, they're still uh, the machinery is still computing whether or not they're going to win, whether or not it actually uh -huh. has if they can uh, get what they want through intimidation and not actually having to put up for it. Uh, right. So when you get this drunken people, yeah, confusing questions, dialogue in general. Uh, one of the tricks uh, oh. bouncers that I will use is they'll go, I can't really hear you. Uh, you know, it's so loud in here. Let's. let's uh, can, can we talk outside? Can you t oh, tell me over here? He gets him outside of the place and goes, you're out. You can't come back in. Bye. You know, it never <laughs> has to lay a hand on him, never has to touch him. That's great. And, uh, you know, it's just a matter of having better faculties and, and, and negotiating the conversation because they're looking for a specific response. They, they want your, your verbal response to also be aggressive, to match theirs, to try and ramp up. But even amongst that, when, they want you to one display some sort of opportunity to where they, they make them believe they can win. And two, they want you to get as incensed and incense them to continue this whole, this whole thing. They want yeah. to be in this and, together. They don't want to do it by themselves. Right. And, and that is what, that is what Trump does in his, in his sort of constant uh, uh, slinging of shit. And, and the point has been made, you become dumber the minute you start arguing with them, you know, it's like, I, uh, you know, I'm not going to argue with you as to whether or not a mask will help you in a pandemic, mm -hmm. because the fact that I feel the need to argue this point, I immediately become dumber. Well, just I by, mean, the idea, the I, mean, I personally take the, I, and I have taken this position for a long time. Like I, yeah, well, uh, I just, I don't listen to what politicians tell me at all. I don't yeah, listen to yeah, or any, any yeah. of them. I mean, most of I, them uh, have yet to really prove to me that they are really that competent to even be in office at all. No, that, you know? that's, uh, yeah, if, if that's I look not at it new. That, sadly, lens, that's not new. And it's know, not it's specific just, to this country. Oh, yeah. No, that's it's the nature of the job. Who wants that job? It's like, you yeah. know, it's like being politician is like being a guidance counselor. You know, it's like, why am I <laughs> oh, taking career man, advice man, from let me you? Tell you? All the guidance counselors I come across are. Yeah. Uh, 
So I, I just I, I don't listen to the politicians at all. And I haven't uh, other than to just to just have an idea, like what kind of bullshit are they trying to push down my throat? Sure. I mean, I just see them as basically rent seekers, not people here to actually solve problems. They're just trying yeah. to manage things, it's manage, nature. manage already badly managed things. Yeah. Their job is to keep their job. Um, but l- yeah. let's get back to you. So was your first was your pre- first first professional engagements fighting you went to japan no my first one uh was at am how old were you you you, in kirkland washington how old were you when you realized you were going to do this for a living uh 16 years old i was watching ufc 2 on a tape and i had heard about the ufc but i hadn't seen it so i wasn't really all that sure what to expect it sounded awesome to me uh, and I knew that uh, the first one was won by was won by a guy who they all said did judo back then. I was like, see, I told you, grappling judo. I mean, that was one of the first martial arts I ever got involved with was judo through uh, uh, another great mentor of mine, Fred Sato. So uh, mm-hmm. I, I'm like, yeah, of course. So of course that guy would win. And then someone came up with a tape. And I'm just going, oh, this is this is the day, man. I have been waiting so long to see this. And I'm watching UFC 2, and I think it is the coolest, greatest thing I have ever seen. This is every martial arts flick, video game, pro wrestling match in real life. Finally come to pass. Now we get to see it. And I just said to myself, I don't know how. I don't know what it's going to take. I have no clue how I'll make this happen, but one day I am going to do this. It was as simple as that. And I just, from that point on, when the opportunities made themselves available, like learning that one of the security guards in our school, uh, a Vietnamese fellow had trained Muay Thai down in Thailand before. So getting him to work, to hold pads for me and teach me things about Thai boxing. One of my buddies, uh, he had done a little bit of amateur boxing and he had some, uh, some focus mitts. So us, hitting pads or then meeting another guy who was a martial artist, uh, mostly uh, Kali and Eskrima Filipino styles, but had trained Muay Thai as well with that same uh, um, security guard, Sujai Kutrakun. And so this guy, Edwin mm-hmm. Romorosa, loved the UFC, was just all about being a completely complete, well-rounded martial artist. So I would teach wrestling techniques and then train knife fighting and stick fighting and whatever we could put together. Uh, in a church basement. So for me, it was just piecemealing every, it's like just a, a series of really bad open mics. I guess that's the easiest <laughs> way to put it until, something I until we are able to, uh, <laughs> yeah, something to, to ground ourselves into uh, real capability. And well, let me, this is probably a good time to ask this question then. Uh, I was in uh, I was in a movie years ago, and sp- spent two days hanging out with Jack Lemmon and James Garner, mm. uh, and and I had a bit part in their movie called My Fellow Americans. Yeah, but good old Rockford. Because of the scene, yeah. Well, James Garner, you know, after the first day, he starts telling stories, and he was in Bruce Lee's dojo in Hollywood mm. in the late sixties. What was it about Bruce Lee that made Bruce Lee Bruce Lee? And in a modern context, is Bruce Lee still Bruce Lee? Oh, Bruce Lee is pioneer status. But that doesn't make Bruce Lee the greatest fighter of all time, but it does make him uh, a very important hinge upon which the the maturation and and evolution of martial arts hinges because uh, Bruce was one of the first, especially mainstream and popular, martial artists uh to take on the 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 ethos of not being locked into one way of doing things but actually and to use a a bruce lee phrase eat the meat and spit out the bone to grab as much when it comes to combat as possible and train yourself in fact so fred sato so bruce is from hong kong but his origin in the United States is Seattle. He went to Garfield High School. He went to the University of Washington. Uh, his first gym, his first school was uh, behind Ruby Chow's on University Way. 
And the first three people that trained with Bruce Lee uh, uh, was Taki Kimura, Jesse Glover, Jesse being the first guy, and Fred Sato. So Fred Sato, okay. my first right, football yeah. coach, so and the guy are, who got me into yeah. to judo, was the, one of the first people to ever train with Bruce Lee. And they would speak of him and just like... Oh, yeah, they had... He was, he was respect. mortal. And but, Bruce yeah. was, oh, for sure. And, you know, I'm sure he could have, he could be beaten too, but. I was just saying Brad Pitt beat him up in that Quentin Tarantino movie. So we know he could be beaten. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, and and uh, I could, I could easily defend that, even though I understand the, the, uh, uh, well, I understand yeah. where that, that movie is. A, it that wasn't movie is a fairy literal. tale. That's why it's titled once upon a time. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. And, and, and honestly, I looked at it as, you know, my first thoughts are to see this, uh, uh, to think of it objectively as true would, would, yeah, it's, you know, you're going it, to, it's insulting to me, but what I took it was that wasn't Bruce Lee. That was the way Hollywood saw Bruce Lee. That was the way, um, the interpretation of martial arts and Kung Fu. And, and it wasn't Bruce Lee, Bruce, that Bruce Lee in the movie was, a uh, and a, a, uh, metaphor for uh, the broader like bullshit way of approaching the reality of life that you, there was constant thread that ran through that whole movie like mm -hmm. living in this snow globe of unreality and thinking that that yeah. is true right still happens yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course both, it does we both, yeah, but uh, we both live um, in the you know they the all bruce lee was a very explosive athlete he was very, uh, uh, very strong, had, had tons of, could generate a ton of power very fast. But, the, but also he was taboo in the Kung Fu community because he was taking Kung Fu and teaching it to Westerners, but also breaking the, the, the accepted norms of Kung Fu and taking in new styles, training Judo, training Sabah, training all these other things and saying, oh, these things are all... Um, necessary and capable yeah, they're all of a piece, not exclusive. everything one needed and in fact right. that depended on the individual as well because bruce would always say i do things the way i do them because they're the best things that i found for me but that doesn't mean it's going to be the best way for you to do it and so that was that was not something that people ever talked about and i think bruce lee is is well and legitimately deserving of all the praise he has gotten one of the like like everybody else, I just watched the Michael Jordan documentary on Netflix. I think I'm the only and, one that hasn't. Oh, really? It's it's very entertaining. It's it it it's very because it's not about basketball. It's about right. it's about human beings and it's about exceptional human beings. Uh, and you know, one of the things that I found fascinating is, uh, you know, they're. Michael Jordan is in a series against the Celtics and during the day he's golfing with Danny Ainge and then they're going to, and then they play that night when you're in the UFC and, and, and you're fighting these guys, do you have off the mat friendships and relationships with these guys? Because it's not like we're going to golf in the afternoon and then we're going to play basketball against each other. It's like, we're going to golf in the afternoon and then we're going to try to kill each other. It struck me as, is are, are the, inter, are the relationships between competitors different? Uh, like, I, like, I know that Ali had a grudging friendship, like uh, grudging respect for, uh, Frazier, uh, and, uh, and even Foreman, I think at the end of his career, um, do you have interpersonal relationships with people that you then go out and try to fight? Yes. Um, to be honest, it's more the rarity that I don't like somebody on a personal level more than, than being able to, at the very least, have a uh, respectable uh, or respect-based um, just general affiliation with someone, let alone to, to really actually being close friends with them. Because as, as weird as it may sound, there's, hardly anything that'll bring you closer to somebody than literally trying to kill each other. I understand that. And, and, and both of you, I think feel, and this is the same, this is also true in show business. It's true in professional basketball, as I've learned in that documentary, like mm -hmm. you guys are fighting each other, but you're both fighting the same enemy, which is the corporation for which you work. <laughs> uh, the front, well, the front often office. happens. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. 
It's like, you know, you whoever is the head of the UFC, you know, the guy in the suit, you you both have a belly full of him and you have that in common. Uh, I mean, it does come. I'm not speaking. I'm not speaking about anybody in specifically, but in general, like, you, you know, you're you're both you both roll your eyes at management and you have that in common. Uh, we, we do. But I think that the even the greater bond is literally the fact that in combat like that, there is no ability to keep your persona up. The mask drops always. You, whoever you mm-hmm. actually are will always generally be shown to not just your opponent, but to the entire world. And so uh-huh. um, dealing with people in, in such a sincere environment strips away all of the other bullshit that gets in the way of really understanding anything about each other. And the fact that you're willing to, to get in that ring in the first place already sets a bit of a tone, but that also comes with this implicit uh, statement that I am, you know, of a, of a certain, I hold myself to a certain higher, higher point of, of, uh, uh, toughness, uh, courage, uh, reality, so to speak. And if that there's a bit of code of code is, of honor, seen less code than of that, honor. well, yeah, it is, is very much, uh, linked to the concept of honor culture. So, right. You, you say, I'm assuming, I don't know, you know, after about whoever wins, whoever loses good fight, or, you know, I'm assuming that civil words are exchanged or is mm-hmm. that, Oh yeah. I mean, generally, I mean, you can, you can easily hate everything about it, but Mm -hmm. it's, it could easily have gone either way and they're winning, even, even though it is at your, your, um, to your detriment, it wasn't, they didn't necessarily look, you just happened to be either a, like on the ladder where they needed to go or just mm-hmm. the person that was uh, the opponent that was brought up. And even at times you're the person they wanted to fight because they respected you so much because they saw something in you that they wanted mm-hmm. to experience for themselves. They wanted your punch to hit them in the schnoz. Uh, I mean, I you know. don't if play video games. If the only fun like you I have is to. golf, I don't understand you. I uh, look, I gave up my old man sport was, was determined a long time ago. It's bowling. Cause uh, hell if I'm going to go out and if I'm out somewhere with a bunch of greenery and, and ponds and all that, I don't want to be driving a little electric cart across it, getting shit faced. Yeah. I'd rather be shit faced in the woods, uh, <laughs> you know, doing something like well, my, that. You know, so otherwise I, I will just throw a heavy ball down a lane. Yeah. My father is 89 years old. He lives to go hunting. He started, he started to go hunting when he was probably 10 or 11. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I grew up in a house full of rifles and camo clothing. And, yeah. you know, every dog we had was a bird dog. And, and he's 89 years old and he's still, he, that's what he lives for. And that's what keeps him going. Sure. That's and what, my, you know. That's what I grew up in too. I, I was hunting uh, since a young age around the same time. My dad was, I, you could really call him a Nimrod. He was a master hunter. He was incredible with what he could do in the woods and how he could find game and what, what, when he knew where they would be and what time to see them. He was a great fisherman. Uh, and what the thing for me, besides the fact that, you know, I really do like game meat, but it made me so much more appreciative and respectful of not only the environment, but every all the animals within it. And it made mm-hmm. me have such an appreciation for animals that I don't think I would have had otherwise. Like uh, the way I see from, from dogs and cats to, to deer and grouse and pheasant. And I just, I absolutely love the fact that these things exist. I love what nature is and even the unabashed and unapologetic brutality of nature. And yes, you know, yes, it, it, yes, yes. Yeah. Nature is, the, uh-uh. nature is the least woke entity. <laughs> 
<laughs> nature doesn't care. Oh, for sure. It, <laughs> it, it is, uh, nature it is very, very problematic, I guess you could say. In yeah, its own nature, way, is, but... nature is inherently, nature is inherently problematic. No, but it's true. Like, you know, my father, obviously, and you know, not, this, this is not a political observation, but like my, my father is a Republican and, you know, watches Fox news and, you know, he's 89 years old and he's in the NRA. And that's, that's, of course he is. Of, of course he is. And the only time I saw my dad, like really angry, you know, like genuinely angry at something on the news was when uh, Dick Cheney shot his friend in the face because they were doing that kind of hunting where they sit in a stand and the yeah. birds are flushed out in front of them, which was so obscene to my dad, whose whole thing is you go out in the woods, you freeze your ass off, you track, you find you. And, and I'll never forget it. Cause it was, you know, cause normally like any Republican who's like gets a pass when he saw that, my father, I just remember him like spitting, fuck him. Like, so, mm-hmm. like, it was so, it was so offensive to him. Mm. You know, and you know, that's, that, that, that to me, um, uh, rings of, of something I believe. And that is that we fall too often into our, uh, into these tribal, especially sure, in you, regards to politics, which, which cracks me up because, well, it's you know, cause the, it's, and we are, I don't because think it's that a the people really, there's yeah. money in it. If there was yeah, money in it, it wouldn't really happen. Really up at that upper echelon, really. No, they don't. Re- yeah, they don't. They don't really give a shit about no, it's just, all of it's, us. It's um, it's but, just a but, way uh, to divide and define a market. Yeah, to sell and, them and we need to sell them, and to try and keep certain things beyond tribal politics. In fact, that there are things that are deeper and more important than those. And when those things are crossed, or those lines are crossed, or those things are not adhered to, that regardless of whatever flag you want to wave as far as your political affiliation or whatever like you just have to go now that's fucking bullshit sure sure yeah no i yeah you know i i have done uh i have i've said this before but like you know i i've i've worked with charlton heston and i've worked with michael moore and i agree with michael moore more than i agree with charlton heston but i would much rather have lunch with charlton heston that's because charlton heston was screaming about damn dirty apes and he was in planet <laughs> of the apes and even uh cat and i were made a joke the other uh, last night because uh what this kid at the distillery his his middle name is cornelius and i'm like you don't say cornelius oh, well, huh do, do you have a doctor well, named let, Zayas in your me, family or what let me blow your mind i'm gonna step away from the screen for four seconds and i'll edit this out this is a piece of ape city from planet of the apes that I picked up off the ground in Malibu Creek State Park where they shot it. You know, that weird Flintstones town that they lived in? Uh-huh. This was it. <laughs> this huh, was it. That is so freaking hands. cool. You know what? Yeah. I have something to edit that you can you can edit. Uh, uh, let me bring you something. It's it's not ape related, but you'll love it. It's from Taxi Driver. It is the buttons Holy where they shit. screwed up. It is from Taxi Driver. Said by and uh that that button in Taxi Driver. Uh, rejected by one of my heroes, Albert Brooks, who people forget is. And yes, what, 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 these buttons are wrong. These, this isn't right. <laughs> wow. I was talking, yeah. about, I was talking about taxi driver earlier today because the, the scene, the scene that Scorsese has in taxi driver where he's in the cab going, you ever see what a 44 Magnum does to a woman's pussy? That you should see <laughs> that you should see. And they're like Martin Scorsese is like, Hmm, I want to, I want to have just a little role in this movie. You know, my parents are going to come yeah. and see it. I want them to see me on screen. I know who I'll play. <laughs> who'd, who'd be this there? is a weird, wonderful world. This is a weird, wonderful <laughs> world, man. Uh, and, let me, let me um, ask you, one. you know, I'm a huge horror movie fan, too. I get people. Oh, good. Uh, watching giallos and weird Italian flicks. And they're just like, what oh, the yeah. fuck did you fuck just show yeah. me? Yeah. Well, uh, when we're done here, I have to go back to writing the script I've been hired to write for Creep Show, so I have to. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. I'm 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 all in. Well, um, I have my own uh, my own uh, schlocky exploitation giallo in my head. someday. maybe I'll get it to screen. Oh, uh, that's excellent. Yeah, no, it is. It's you know, um, I'm a comedian, but um, horror movies are my football. That's what I used to say. Yeah, that's my football. That's what I like. Well, isn't the thing about comedians? Um, you guys are all just one like one step away from just stabbing a whole pile of people. Yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, I, I think know I get Joe. Along with it's them. just 
Yeah, it's the same thing. <laughs> yeah, it, it's the same thing. Yeah. Joe is the, but now there's the new thing with like Joe and Kamel, which is the super ripped comedian, which is a new, which is a new thing. <laughs> my whole thing was talking my way out of the fight. Um, <laughs> Uh, but very quickly, and uh, I'm going to, uh, one, by the way, uh, I, I never get to, I never get a chance to say this to anybody. So I'm going to say it to you now. My girlfriend has not stopped talking about the knife you gave her. I don't get, a ch- <laughs> I don't get to say that a lot. <laughs> um, uh, at least now I know how I'll die. Tell us about uh, uh, Warbringer Whiskey, why, you, why you're associated with it, and where one can get it. Uh, I'm associated with it because uh, Alfred, one of the owners, slid into my DMs and said, hey, we should do this. And I thought, hmm, you've been reading my mind. I have been talking to some different distilleries about trying to, to get something actually on the market. And I went up there, sat down, met with Alfred and David, and I was blown away with the product and their 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 uh approach towards it all and so we all meshed on the same ideas and and since then i've i've taken a more direct role into working in the distillery uh when i can working with the distilling runs and milling grain to just sweep in the floors yeah it's and, sort of uh, like uh i i absolutely love our product and stand behind it i i love being able to create things that make the world better in some way so and it I, is, I love the hell it, out of it and what is amazing about whiskey, and this is where I can, especially in knowing a little bit about this brand, is it, it, it is, it is a, it is a science, mm-hmm. it is a craft, and there is art. There is, you know, and, and uh, yeah, and there's, you know, there's it's, absolutely it's not art. ladies, but it'll do. Yeah, but it is like this is. I mean, this, as you know, this product was created by a biochemist, mm-hmm. and you know, it was not made in the Ozarks. <laughs> <laughs> and it's in a still, and uh, and there's a there's a craft to creating it, and then there's an element of art that goes into it, and then it does feed into this historical tradition of what whiskey is to people and how it how it is in in Japan. Like uh, you look at a, at, at, at a country with this this incredible that goes back to you know this feudal history, and they're like so much farther along than we in America were at that time. You know, they've been sophisticated for centuries we're not even 300 years old and uh and 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 whiskey which came to their culture late Mm -hmm. uh but but what a huge uh uh, effect it's had in their culture how quickly it's been taken into their culture um uh, and it it is a universal language in in its in its own way and uh it brings people together things like this bring people together and to be a part of that is uh, is amazing i'm going to send you because I have one, a King Kong Cab Company T-shirt, which I can get. <laughs> also from Texas. that uh, King Kong Cab Company. That it, or do you mean like that's from, also uh, Taxi the Driver? Movie, uh, what was the movie with? Oh, it's Taxi Driver. Okay, yeah, I was, for some driver. reason you got me thinking about uh, DC Cab <laughs> with Bill Maher and Mr. T. And Mr. T. And the the Barbarian Twins, the Barbarian Brothers. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Very good. Oh man! Well, I could uh, I, I I could go on, but uh, I've, I've tortured you enough. Uh, where would you suggest people uh, go on YouTube, see your fights? What do you? How do people? Yeah, I mean, you, they could do that, but uh, joshbarnett.com will take them to pretty much anything they need to go. Uh, it's got information great. on our great whiskey, Warbringer and Warbringer War Master Edition. Uh, it's got Josh Barnett's blood sport information on there. My pro wrestling event that I, I produce. Uh, it's will lead you to my Instagram and Twitter, Josh L Barnett. And yeah, I mean, I'm not hard to find. No, well, this is this is this has been great. Uh, I I really enjoyed talking to you. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to do the podcast. And what I love is to look at you and to look at me. People would think, well, those two have there's oil and water personified. <laughs> <laughs> those two have nothing in common. And actually, all you have to do is talk to somebody for three minutes, and you find out you have so much in common. That's that's the greatest thing. Yeah. Um. But uh, yeah, we I will all generally uh, have far more in common than we have apart. To find out more about Warbringer Whiskey, why not visit sespeecreekspirits.com. S-E-S-P-E-C-R-E-E-K spirits.com. Other podcasts reach for the sky. David Goldbaum.
This has been the Dana Gould Hour, brought to you by the Internet. Music by Andy Paley, with Jake Posner behind the board. Produced by Jeff Fox. Graphic design and web production by Spencer Hunt and Segan Friend. Sound editing and post-production by Jalinda Palmer and Joe Napolitano. Hey, if you like the show, why don't you drop us a line at show at danagould.com. Tom Kenny speaking. I'm a DJ, I'm a DJ, I'm a person, I'm a person, I'm a singer, I'm a singer, I love to sing, and DJ, boom. Peace out, peace out. You want me? Peace out. Boom. <laughs>